right Okay, so let me just do that little introduction again. So Microworld, how microfossils unravel ancient natural histories by Anka Marsh. Anka is a paleoecologist specializing in microfossils and sediments to better understand the relationship between humans and their environments, especially in the light of changing environments and climate. She's worked across the Mediterranean and the Middle East regions, including Sicily, Sardinia, Morocco, Iraq and Qatar. She is currently working on a joint UCL and University, that's University College London for people who are not, maybe not local, and University of Chicago project. And that's analyzing archive sediment samples from the archeological site of Nippur and its environs. So I'm gonna hand you over to her now. Um, any questions, if just pop those into the chat as we go along and then we'll finish off with a question and answer session. So over to you, Anka. Hi, uh, thanks. Let me just um, share my screen. It's frozen. Hold on a second. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's. Hold on. We've gone. <laughs> slightly ahead of ourselves but we can we, the screen share is working so it's just yeah my... let's just go back sorry you get a sneak preview of everything <laughs> yeah, sneak preview. there we go this is what happens when you test your site and then you forget to go back to the beginning um hi yeah thank you very much maria for the introduction and as maria said I am a paleoecologist so I look at um, microfossils specifically phytoliths um, some sponges uh, freshwater sponges some diatoms um, and a few other weird and wonderful things that I happen to find in my slides. Um, so I decided today, I, I wanted to share a little bit about um, microfossils and um, what they can tell us about ancient environments. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of start off with um, a little bit about why we look at microfossils and which microfossils we might um, use. There are actually quite a number of microfossils, so I can't possibly cover them all today. Um, and then I will go in and I will describe a few microfossils in more detail and then go into a case study, um, particularly our project in Nippur, which we've just managed to restart after the pandemic. And my cat is meowing in the background, so you'll have to ignore that. So why microfossils? Basically, because they are actually really, really cool looking. So these are just some of the silica-based microfossils that I come across in my slides. Some of them, I know what they are. Some of them, I haven't got a clue. So this one up here, no idea. I have no idea what that is. I do know that that's a diatom. Um, so, you know, it's, you find when you're looking down a microscope, you do find a lot of things that you do know what they are and you can identify them and you're very happy. And then you find things and you just haven't got a clue what it is. You just know it's some sort of microfossil. It represents something. Um, so why do we study microfossils? Well, they provide a lot of information for paleoenvironmental studies. Um, information on ancient temperatures, climates, and environments. Um, so what was it like in the past and how did this change through time and also through space? Um, we can see indirect evidence of climate and environmental change in the um, microfossil record. So for instance, if we look at some sediments from um, a lake sequence, we can see we'll have like a group or community of, of diatoms, which are freshwater diatoms. They like deeper water, they like fresher water, clearer water. And eventually those diatoms are replaced by diatoms that prefer saline conditions. And what we can infer from that is some kind of climate change where there's increasing aridity, less water going into the lake. So the lake levels are going down and becoming more saline over time. We can also infer a lot of information um, from microfossils from archeological sites. Um, so we learn about site economies, resource use, as well as trade networks. So what, you know, people who lived at this site in the Middle Bronze Age, um, for instance, 
Um, what did they eat? What did they grow? How did they grow things? Where did they grow things? Did they use irrigation? Um, and we can also track trade. So oftentimes we come across um, plants and other things that we know are not native to that specific area. So there's two possibilities. Either there's um, you know, trade, so things are coming up, say, from southern Iraq up to Turkey, or we might um, see um, crops that were domesticated in one place and then they're brought over to another place and, and um, they're grown there. So we see this with the Silk Road, for instance, um, that connected the Near East with the Indus Valley and China. So what we have is um, millet, for instance, and rice, which, was, um, which were domesticated in um, Indus Valley and China, being brought eventually over to the Near East and the Near East in return sending over wheat to that area. Um, and we also get a lot of information from microfossils about how people modified their local environments. We see a lot of deforestation and slash and burn agriculture, for instance, and that will completely change um, the plant communities that we see within those areas. So what microfossils? Well, as I said before, can't cover them all. There are zillions and zillions of microfossils. So the microfossils that I will specifically talk about um, will be phytoliths, foraminifera, diatoms, and pollen. But we do have you know, a number of other phyto, um, microfossils that are quite useful. So phytoliths, diatoms, sponges, pollen, foraminifera, um, dinoflagellates, which are really weird looking. And there's also a lot of other things um, like this one that I found the other day, no idea what it is. If anyone knows, please put something, a comment in the um, comment box. I'll be really, really appreciative. Um, so the first microfossil that I will um, talk about is the phytolith, which is actually my main microfossil that I use. Um, so phytolith comes from the Greek phyto for plant, lith for rock, so specifically um, plant rocks, and that's pretty much what they are. So there's soluble silica in soils, and um, the um, vascular plants will take up the soluble silica, not all of them, but many of them will take it up through the root system, and then the silica will travel up through the, um, the stems, the leaves, um, into um, seed bracts, um, into bark, so all over the place. And um, the soluble silica will go and it will kind of infill the cellular spaces as well as the extracellular spaces, so the, sp um, the, the empty spaces between cells. And um, then the silica hardens, it polymerizes, and when the plant dies, all the silica bits fall to the ground, they're buried later by um, later sediments, and then they're preserved. And then along comes somebody like me who takes some samples and takes them to the lab and looks at, looks at them down the microscope. Um, so these are made of silica, so they're very, very robust. They preserve well in most sediments. They preserve well in archeological contexts. Um, so we find a lot of them in dung from, you know, animals. Um, we find them in hearths and find them on floors and all over the place in archaeological contexts. Um, and they're particularly abundant in um, areas with high evapor um, evapotranspiration. So arid conditions like we find across the Near East and also on um, tropical conditions um, in parts of Africa and South America. Um, they're useful because they give us a lot of information about what's going on on site at archeological sites, but also off sites for environmental studies. So on site, we can look at resource use. Um, we look at what they're bringing onto the site to use for bedding, matting, for baskets, for roofing material. What, you know, we can determine if they're using charcoal for their um, hearths or if they're using dung fuel. Um, we can look at um, where they are storing grains, and we can look at um, activity areas within sites. 
And in terms of offsite samples, they can be used for general um, um, environmental studies, paleoenvironmental studies, and we can also look for field systems. So we can find out where people were growing things and what they were growing things or what they were growing and how they were growing them. Were they using irrigation, for instance? Um, we also can look for indirect evidence of any climate change. So there might be a succession um, between C3 festicoid grasses versus C4 panicoid grasses. So, oops, actually, well, what I do um, when I'm looking down the microscope is obviously I need to identify what these microfossils are, what these um, phytoliths are. And I'll show you some pictures of these in a second. Um, so once I've ID'd them and I note them down, I then count the numbers of the different types of phytoliths that I can find. I then put them through um, statistical analyses. So this would include uh, principal component um, analysis, multiple, multiple, oh, uh, multiple of, uh, oh, I can't even think of the word right now. Sorry, my brain's gone. Um, but um, various types of analyses, um, including correlation. And then this actually then um, shows us trends over time. So we can see these changes. We can see, you know, the increase of C4 grasses over a certain period of time, for instance. Now these are phytoliths, and at the bottom here we have three single cell phytoliths, and then we have a number of multi-cell phytoliths. So single cells um, for many grasses will give us an indication of whether we have C3 grasses or C4 grasses. Um, we are not able, in most cases, to get down to genus or species level. Um, so for this single cell here, this is a rondelle, looks a bit like a hat with a bobble here, and this is um, found in C3 grasses. This here is a bilobe, so it looks a bit like a dumbbell, like something you'd use for weights, um, and it has different shapes depending on whether it's a C3 type grass or a C4 type grass, and this here is a little stomata. Um, I'm now going to discuss these three multi-cells, just to give you an idea of what we need to look for when we identify a multi-cell phytolith to genus or species level. So multi-cell is what you would think. It's a multiple cells, individual cells that are stuck together, they're conjoined. And what we have here, this is barley, this one is emmer wheat, and this one is durum wheat. And there are a few criteria which tell me why these are um, those particular species. So for this multicell, we have these, I don't know if you can see them here, but these are squiggly, I just call them squiggly lines. These are the cell walls. And essentially what you have, if you can just make this out here, we have a long cell here and another long cell there and another one here. Now, long cells in the husks of all grasses are not straight walled. They have these dendritic things kind of poking out on the sides. And those dendritic things then connect to each other between the individual long cells. And the silica not only infills this long cell bit, but also in between. And so the squiggly bits is basically the extracellular recess between the two um, cells. And in barley, the cell um, wall is, tends to be a little bit more regular. So we just have these nice undulations. Um, also in barley, we have these cork, uh, these kidney-shaped cork cells. And um, we have papillae. Now the papillae have, they look like flowers. And so there was a round bit in the middle and then these kind of protrusions coming up um, on the outside. And um, we, they're actually called pits, these um, things that surround the round bit. But in um, barley, we have seven to nine pits or petals. And then the round bit actually kind of sticks out like a cone. So those elements all tell me this is barley. If I only had several of these elements, I couldn't say that it was barley for sure. 
Now, emmer wheat, okay, this is a nice big phytolith, thankfully, because it has lots of different elements. Now, emmer wheat makes things a little bit difficult. Wheat in general should have irregular squiggly lines. Um, but unfortunately, what emmer wheat does is that some of these lines will be more regular. So it kind of looks like barley. So if I only had this segment of the multicell, I couldn't tell you if it was wheat or barley. Luckily, emmer does give us a couple of other indications that it is a wheat rather than a barley. So this is another papillae here. And actually you can see there's lots of papillae. And the papillae in all wheats has 10 to 12 of these petals or um, pits surrounding it, as opposed to the seven to nine that barley has. Um, emmer, the round bit here, doesn't stick out like a cone. Instead, it looks hairy. It has these little protrusions sticking out. So those things all put together tell me, yes, this is emmer. Now we've got durum. Durum also makes life a little bit difficult. So the um, extracellular, the, the cell walls here, they're irregular. Great, okay, could be wheat. Oh, but wait, we've got a kidney-shaped cork cell. Great, isn't that for barley? Oh, wait a second, here's the papillae and look, it's cone-shaped. Again, that indicates barley. Thankfully, the papillae, the pits around 10 to 12. So we know this is durum wheat. So I'm gonna be testing you at the end of this. Now we have um, diatoms. These are made out of the same material that um, phytoliths are made out of. They are made out of the soluble silica. They are unicellular algae, and they can be found in many different, usually watery contexts from fresh water to um, marine. And some also can be found um, in um, kind of to more terrestrial um, circumstances like on top of mosses and things. There are some 30,000 plus species. More species are being found all the time. In fact, we found a subspecies in um, Kurdistan. So they are, you know, they're just there ready to be discovered. The thing about diatoms that make them really, really good for paleoenvironmental research is that they're very particular about where they live. They like water that is very fresh or very deep, um, doesn't move around too much. Um, so when we um, understand individual species ecologies, we're able to get um, more information about what that paleo environment was like. The identification for diatoms is similar to phytoliths. We have reference sets and databases, line drawings. So we basically are looking at the shapes of um, the individual diatoms. We're looking at their ornamentation, striations, lines, dots, um, anything that kind of sets it apart from the other diatoms. And again, once they're identified, they're counted, graphed out, and um, trends are looked for um, in terms of trying to better understand what is going on in that particular layer. Um, they are used for a number of different studies. Um, so we've got um, climate studies so we can look at water depth. So if we think again about that lake sample where um, the salinity levels increase and we see a change in um, the uh, diatom community, we can also um, look at pollution levels. So diatom communities will change if there's a sudden input of phosphate and nitrate um, pollution from, um, from agricultural practices. Um, That doesn't work. There we go. We also have pollen. I think most people are fairly familiar with pollen, especially in the summertime when we're all sneezing. And uh, pollen is really, really quite um, cool. It's, um, it's not made out of silica. This time it's made out of a um, material called exine. Um, but again, it's very, very robust in um, some sediments. And you can see from this example here, we've got lots of different types of pollen. So there's, you know, this one and this one are similar. These two are similar. This one's completely different. These are similar to that one, but they are all um, indicative of different species of plants. 
And um, so that's essentially how they're identified by their morphology, their shapes, their ornamentation. And again, they're counted and graphed out in order to see different trends um, that may become apparent um, through time and also across space. Um, Pollen has been um, really good in terms of looking at interglacial and glacial sequences. There are some very, very good pollen sequences that are robust, they're firmly dated, um, and so they can show us um, what is happening with the plant communities and refugia, uh, refugia and, and, and whatnot. So very, very good to, um, for that. We also can get information about plant migration and introduction of crops up into new areas. And they're very good for climate studies and um, also impact of humans. So we sometimes can see traces of um, agricultural crops moving into areas that may have been um, purely trees um, earlier on. Foraminifera are also really, really interesting. Um, some foraminifera are actually um, mesoscopic in that you can just see them and then some are microscopic. So if you go to the beach and you sometimes get these little white specks on your ankles or something and they won't brush off, um, have a look. I'm sure some of you are bringing hand lenses to the beach. It isn't just me. Um, if you take some of these little white flecks and look at it on um, using your hand lens, you'll see um, that they're actually, um, some of them are foraminifera. They are mainly marine protozoans, um, although there are a few species that live in freshwater. Um, so that really should, the next line should really say freshwater to salt marsh to deep ocean is where they're found. And they are essentially tests or like little shells with chambers um, made out of calcite and they kind of swirl in different ways. And you can see that there's, again, different shapes, different morphologies, and this is how they are identified um, and counted in um, studies. Um, we can use them to understand better sea levels and how they fluctuate through time. They're also used for climate studies. Um, in that respect, uh, the the, the, they actually use the foraminifera for um, isotopic analyses. So they're looking at stable isotopes of oxygen, so oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, looking at the ratios of those two. And then that kind of tells you information about how cold it is, whether you're in an interglacial or a glacial period. Oh, keep clicking on the wrong thing. Um, I'm now gonna go into methods um, with the caveat that um, these are the methods that I'm using for these particular types of samples, um, but there are lots and lots of different types of methods and it will really depend on the microfossils that you're looking at and also the time period. So my time period is the Holocene. So I look at the last 10,000 years, usually. Um, I'm not looking at dinosaur period stuff, even though I would love to. So I'm not looking at lithified sediments at rocks. I'm looking at unconsolidated sediments. And um, so essentially I'm digging trenches and then I'm taking samples from the side of these trenches. I should also note that for some reason, my projects seem to involve massive trenches, which is really unusual because trenches are usually, I don't know, two, two by two or three by three. They're not really, really long, enormous trenches like this one. And we will get back to this one in a minute. Um, and then this was another trench that we did. This was for my PhD research in Kurdistan. Um, as you can see, it was absolutely mammoth. Um, five meters deep, about 22 meters long. And I had to actually draw this entire two sections and take samples from all over the place. It was an absolute mammoth task. And I'm just gonna say that this is not common. This is um, a little bit insane what we did. Um, and then I also take samples from archaeological sites. So this is Bakrawa near Halabsha in Iraqi Kurdistan. 
And this is just a kind of a typical step uh, trench. And each layer is actually a different time period. So I just took samples from various parts analyze them and then I could see um, changes in the phytolith community, which might give me some information about um, change of use in the room or um, change in crops that they were using. And once I have these sediments, so the sediments get bagged and labeled, hopefully, otherwise they're useless. Um, and then I have to separate the bits of, phy of phytolith, the silica, from the rest of the sediment, because if I just whacked it under the microscope, I wouldn't be able to see anything. So there are a number of steps that need to be done, and it's a process that takes about two weeks, plus two weeks for the samples to dry, so four weeks in total um, for each batch of samples. So the first thing I need to do is get rid of the calcium carbonates, because they have a tendency to stick to silica and make things very difficult to see. Um, and then afterwards, I need to get rid of the organics. And so that includes um, burning the um, sediment samples in a fur furnace at 500 degrees Celsius. Um, after I do that, I have to get rid of the clays because clays are isotropic. So that means that if I have any clays on my slides, um, the, trend, the light, is, light source is here, the light shines through the microscope here, but because the clays are isotropic, it means that they block all the light. So I won't be able to see anything in my slide. So I have to get rid of the clays, and this is actually a very long manual process. Um, after I've done that, I then can separate the rest of the, the silica from the rest of the sediments. Um, that is done. I dry everything, mount things onto a slide, and um, then I hope that I don't get something that looks like this. This is an absolutely useless slide because it's just bits of silica that can't be identified as anything. Um, but luckily that doesn't happen too often. So now I'm going to get go to Iraq and um, before I talk about Iraq, I just wanted to um, give you a little bit of background information because I don't know how much people know about Iraq and particularly um, the, the extensive history of Iraq. So um, I'm sure that most people have heard about the Fertile Crescent, which is this arc here, um, and know that um, Iraq is the center of, um, or one center, I should say, of domestication of some plants and animals. So um, there were other centers of domestication, including um, the Indus Valley, China, um, and South America, Central America. Um, but in the case of um, the Middle East, I'm really sorry, my rabbit has decided to rummage through some bags in the back behind me. So I hope that she's not making too much noise. Um, in any case, um, the, um, what we find is um, that we have the wild progenitors of emmer wheat and barley, for instance. So we've got emmer wheat that arcs this way here and also barley. And so these two cereals were amongst the first to be domesticated in this region. And the study area, the area that we are going to be concentrating on is right here. So it's this alluvial plain um, that is between the Tigris River here and the Euphrates River here. Baghdad's up here, Basra's down here. And we have the um, Persian Gulf over here. And also just to show you some of the crops that were important in the past across the Middle East and important very um, now. So we have pistachio, chickpea, I should have added lentils, um, wheat, barley, date palm, and of course, olive. And agriculture has been practiced in the Near East for millennia. So it has certainly left its mark all across um, many different environments in um, the Middle East. Um, we have lots of traces of terracing, and you can see here some um, old terracing. Um, 
Zagwa Hills. This is up near the Zagwa Mountains. Hills have been completely denuded of trees and used for grazing and agriculture. So a lot of what you see now of the Middle East isn't representative of what um, was there millennia ago, whether we're talking 5,000 years ago or 8,000 years ago. So it's a completely different landscape and landscape that has been very much modified by human activities for a long time. And we can find traces of all of these activities in the microfossil record. So now onto the case study itself, we have the area Nippur and Umm al hafriyat Nippur is this little dot here in the middle of the alluvial plain. Um, I'm also going to talk about some other core samples that we took from this area here, particularly Uruk and Larsa, so just um, south of the site. And this is just a Google map, and it just shows you here, um, this is Nippur, and then this is Umm al hafiyat These samples were actually not taken from the marsh itself, but just over here to the side. And before I go on to the, to the site, I just want to show you this lovely map that was found on a tablet which dates to the Kassite period. So that is about um, 1531 to 1150 or so um, BC. And it shows the site of Nippur, the town of Nippur. And it also shows this, which is a canal that um, bisects the town into two parts. And so this is a hand-drawn map with the topographical um, features added to it, but there's the canal. And this here is the Euphrates River. And so you can see here, it's marked here as the Euphrates and here the Euphrates River. You can see that it's just outside the town walls of Nippur. But look where Nippur is compared to the Euphrates today. So there's quite a difference. So just bear in mind, not only has the landscape been altered so much by human activity, but we also have these two very large rivers that are shifting along the alluvial plain over time. So where it is now is not where it was in the past. Now, the site of Nippur is a multi-occupation site, um, as I said, located in this particular um, um, alluvial plain. And um, the current climate regime, so the modern climate regime is considered to be subtropical continental with very, very, I'm not even sure why it's subtropical because I can tell you there's nothing tropical about this area. Um, but it is very, very hot with summers um, where it's 43 degrees Celsius in the shade and much, much hotter if you're not in the shade. And there's a very short rainy season um, between December and February. The average rainfall for the whole entire region of Iraq is about 213 millimeters per year, which is not enough for rain fed farming. Um, in Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan near the Zagros Mountains, where we worked pre uh, previous to this project, the average rainfall is about 800 millimeters per, um, per year. So it's much better up there. Um, Baghdad gets about 200 millimeters per year. And Basra, which um, is down here, um, gets about 100 millimeters per year. So it is very dry, very, very dry but they're still planting stuff, they're still growing things. So they have to use a lot of irrigation, which has an impact on their um, groundwater supply. Um, they are growing wheat, barley, sorghum, millet, corn, and rice all in this region. So what we find nowadays is a mix of agricultural land, lots of irrigation um, and scrub land pockets of desertification because the desert is encroaching more and more um, onto this area and also a few marshy areas. Now, the excavations at Nippur started um, quite some time ago and um, by the University of Chicago. And this is actually the canal that we saw earlier in that, um, um, in that map, 
just point it out again, just in case that this canal here. So that's what this is. And this trench that we saw earlier is a um, trench that was cut through the canal right about here. And um, then samples were taken from the sides of the trench by um, Stephen Littner, who's one of my colleagues, in the 1970s. So these samples were taken and wrapped up and stored very carefully in um, a garage in Washington, DC, and a horse farm in Kentucky. I have no idea why, but life is what it is. So these samples sat for many, many years. And um, 50 years later, somehow I ended up with them to analyze. Now, what we wanted to do with this project, and it not only included these um, archived samples from Nippur and Um Ahlad Buyat, but also the core samples that we took from Uruk and Larsa and other sites just south of here, of this site, um, we wanted, we had a number of research questions actually. We wanted to better understand the environmental changes and land use patterns within that alluvial area. Um, and also how things changed over time and how um, they may have differed over space as well. Um, we wanted to track the human modification of this environment through time. And we also wanted to challenge some assumptions that had been made about this area. So we wanted to see how our own data would compare to these assumptions. So there were many assumptions about um, where the um, Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf Coast was at a particular time and how early agriculture started in the specific region. And um, we still have a lot, a lot, a lot of analysis to do. And like I said earlier, we were interrupted by the pandemic. So we are a couple of years behind now, um, but we are already starting to find some really, really interesting things in these microfossil records. So this first is, um, so I just need to move this. I'm not even sure what's going on there. I can't see my, half of my screen because somebody's name's in the way. But in any case, um, these are the results from um, some of the Nippur samples. So these were the samples that were taken from that large trench. And the samples themselves dated from um, 2577 BC um, up to after 766 AD. So we're looking at um, the Middle Bronze Age period into the early medieval or early Islamic period. And we do see a lot of kind of variation between the amounts of um, the total grasses, which include cereals, um, wetland plants, um, kind of trees and shrubs, and dicots, and um, palm. This is the date palm. And um, so what we found, first of all, is that throughout this period, um, cultivation and agriculture was certainly practiced. It was certainly evident in all of the samples. So there was cultivated cereals all the way along and date palm was also present in all samples. Um, but what we found most interesting is sample 306, which dates um, just before 662, so probably in the Sasanian period, we found absolutely massive phytoliths, these things here. So there are multi-cells, lots and lots of cells conjoined together. Some of them had over hundred cells conjoined. And this indicates to us that there was a lot of water available um, in the soils. And so the, the silica, the plants were taking up a lot of water. Now, this only happens if there is an abundant amount of rain and none of our evidence indicates that there's abundant amount of rain. So we can only conclude that this is a result of a mechanized irrigation. So they were already um, prior to 662 irrigating um, this land um, for their cereal crops. And you can see there's an increase of cereal crops a little bit later. We also saw um, 
some interesting other key results. So let me just get to that. Um, so the date palm phytoliths are prevalent all the way through the, um, the samples um, from the uh, Middle Bronze Age through to the early um, Islamic. And this indicates to us the importance of the, um, this crop for Nippur for this whole time period. We also see a switch of emphasis between um, the palm, date palm cultivation and the uh, cereal grain farming. So it's, we're not really sure what's going on. It's like, you know, sometimes they planted, they had more date palms growing and they were concentrating on that. And then sometimes, I don't know if they cleared the area and then planted more cereals. So it's something that we need to check with the other samples from the same trench to see if this is something that um, occurred across this area. And, you know, did they uh, occur at the same time or did they just swap? Um, they had date palms for a period of time here and then they grew them over there and did cereals over here. I don't know. So this is something that we still need to find out and maybe a, um, a topic for another talk. Um, and we also in the, um, um, see increased irrigation, actually rather sudden increase um, in irrigation um, in the mid first millennium, which is also very interesting for um, our research. Now, as I said, we looked at other um, cores as well. Um, so just a little bit south of Nippur. Um, and we had done these cores a little bit earlier before um, the Nippur samples. And um, they also gave us a lot of really useful information and information that we can then um, correlate with what's happening in Nippur. So core M38, which was taken in a paleo channel, so an old river channel just outside of Oruok and Larsa, um, gave us a lot of very interesting information and also um, put to bed a lot of hypotheses about the area. So these samples date, um, they're much earlier than the samples that we had um, from Nippur. So they date from 7750 BCE to 4900 BCE. So we are well and truly in the Neolithic period here. So the advent of farming, the advent of domestication of plants and animals in the area. And we see with the phytolith evidence, um, a shift from um, moving from a marshy wet wetlands environment, all freshwater mined, um, to a more alluvial environment. And we have a temperate climate regime indicated by um, the, um, the, uh, the presence of C3 plants. There is indication of agriculture quite early on, so right here in this sample, so this here, this is a nice um, barley uh, multi-cell, which was found um, in a sample dating to about 6,000 BCE. And there is some possible evidence of earlier agriculture. So dating all the way back to about 7,000 BCE. So pushing agriculture quite early in this region. And, um, we also have the presence of date palm. So these purple bits. So date palms there, it's not as um, prevalent as it was in Nippur, but it is there. I'm not sure if they were cultivating it at this point, but it's there quite early on. And another interesting thing is this guy. He's a, he's a trichome for oak. And so what we found is the presence of oak up to about 5,000 BCE. So if you think about Iraq and how dry and hot it is now, and then you think about oak trees in that alluvial plain, and yep, there used to be oak trees. Um, we're not really sure why the oak drops off um, right about 5,000 um, BCE. So all along here we have oak and then suddenly it's gone. And we have oak in some of other samples from across that region as well. And um, 
again, in those samples, the oak seems to drop off around 5000 BCE. We also had other microfossils. We had diatoms, which all indicated fresh water, and we had ostracods, which were also fresh water. So what we have is a lot of fresh water, um, kind of marshy areas and wetlands moving into alluvial areas um, over time, and no indication of a marine transgression. So there had been this theory that there was a marine transgression caused by the coast of the Persian Gulf being much closer to Uruk and Larsa at that time, um, and everything being saline and um, nothing being grown there for agriculture or cultivation. However, our microfossil evidence shows that actually there was no marine transgression at that time. Everything was fresh water and there was stuff being grown and um, cultivated there. So key findings from the land of two rivers or Mesopotamia, Iraq, and this alluvial area, um, from, from all the samples that we looked at, we found that agriculture was possible at a much earlier date than um, initially thought. And we have this evidence for early agriculture as well as the cultivation of date palm. Um, as I just said earlier, the early assumption was this area was um, saline um, because of um, the coast being much closer to Uruk and Larsa, um, but we negated this assumption with our findings in um, M38 core. We also could see um, the shift in land use patterns between cereals and um, date palm in Nippur, as well as the increase of uh, use of irrigation in Nippur at a later time. So in conclusion, um, I would like to kind of not only um, say something about like what fatalists can do about the past, but also what um, they might be able to help us in the future. So fatalists and other microfossils provide insights into the different environments within Iraq, and they can also be applied to many other areas across um, the globe, so it's not just Iraq, um, including water management and agricultural strategies. Um, some of the findings that we had were really surprising, such as the discovery of oak in southern um, Iraq, and also the early presence of date palm. And I should just add here, because I forgot to put this in, we had another sample where we had um, date palm dating back to about 10,000 BC. So very, very early date for date palm. Um, what we need to do is calibrate our results more than what we've already done. So we need more data sets, more proxy evidence um, to combine that with what we already have. Um, and we need more dates so that we can um, see when these changes occurred and how rapidly they occur. Um, and then we can look at these and project these changes to see what we might expect in the future of Iraq and other places. Um, climate modeling, this is modeling that was done by one of my colleagues, um, Afra Dam, who's an Iraqi um, a climatologist. And she was looking at the phenology of crop plants um, as seen through um, satellite imagery. And there is um, a decreasing level of precipitation, actually a, a scary levels of decreasing levels of precipitation and a shift in seasonality. So summers are becoming longer, the rainy season's becoming shorter and things are shifting as well. Now this also occurred in, in the past. So if we can understand what happened in the past and how past societies adapted to these changes in rainfall patterns, um, we might be able to de develop mitigation strategies that could help people now deal with um, present and future climate and environmental change. Um, okay, that's it, thanks. <laughs> um, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Anka. That was really fascinating and shed light on, you know, a world that probably a lot of people, um, including myself, not at all familiar with. So that was and really interesting to see how they, you know, how those kind of microfossils can be used to tell you such a lot about ancient, old, you know, environments, but also about kind of people's interaction with, with plants and, you know, 
what they're doing, how they're using different sites. So really interesting. And there's been a lot of questions coming through the chat from almost <laughs> straight away, they started coming through. So if we pick, we'll start off kind of picking some up. I mean, one thing that I think people were interested in, and perhaps it's kind of like more why, where, where microfossils might be found. So mm -hmm. are they found in clay soils as well? And somebody's asking about whether they can be found sort of like in ancient clay pottery, in pottery artifacts. So do you uh, want to say anything about that? Okay, well, in terms of ancient pottery, um, <gasps> okay, so, um, there was some research done um, with diatoms and pottery, and that went nowhere. So that, um, and then we tried to actually do something, and we do have an article. Um, I think it's something like diatoms in the cuneiforms at the British Museum. Um, I can, let me get a pen. Um, I can actually put that article, uh, the, the, the reference up. We tried to um, look at diatoms in, so they're the cuneiform tablets, the, um, the writing tablets that um, the Mesopotamians and, and everyone else, the Chalcites and everyone used to um, keep track of um, how many goats and sheep they had and how, you know, how much a bushel of hay cost and everything. Um, so we have lots of these economic tablets, loads and loads in the British Museum and elsewhere. And we were allowed to examine some of them to see if we could find diatoms and um, try to um, figure out where they were sourcing the clay for these tablets and if it would give us any um, information. It was really difficult to do. And um, it was an interesting project. I'm not sure if it's worth the time because it is very, very difficult to do. Um, you do find microfossils in clays. Um, they tend to actually collect in clays. Um, so um, when you're looking kind of at a sediment profile, if you have sandy layers, the smaller microfossils will actually matriculate down and then collect more in, in the clays um, layers because clays are impermeable. So everything gets kind of stuck and trapped there. Um, Silty clays are probably the best place to look for some of the microfossils. Thank you. And I'm Leah, just, I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to ask Anka a question, which I think I know the answer to. There's been a question about references because mm. obviously th there's a lot of research that you've referenced there, and I'm sure Anka is very happy for this. But in the YouTube description and the thing that goes out afterwards. Is it possible to get a list of references that people can look at? Uh, obviously, a lot of these are going to be yours, Anka, so it's going to give yeah. you... Yeah, I mean, I can list... Um, yeah, I can pull together some references, obviously, um, some of the articles from um, the projects I'm involved in, but also kind of general references for phytoliths, for um, diatoms, there, is, there are a couple of books, general books on microfossils. Mm. Uh, I can't do all the microfossils because it would just, you know, <laughs> I would be here until, you know, next year still I'm doing it. But yeah, I can put some um, some references down. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you going flying up on Google Scholar with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, that'd be really helpful. And obviously, we've, of course, we've got quite a lot of questions. I don't think we'll get through them all. But if, again, if there's kind of a few outstanding questions, if you wouldn't mind kind of maybe just following those up afterwards yeah, as well. But yeah. yeah, having some kind of useful references. Uh, and I think maybe something general, if people are just kind of generally interested in the field, that would be really helpful. OK, um, let, let's just kind of pick up a couple more things then. Um, Somebody asked about C3 and C4 grasses and we mm. did, and somebody did, did explain like what they were and we did, and also somebody very helpfully did put in a, a little explanation, but is it was possible to maybe just give a couple of examples of what will be a, you know, what is a sort of C3 grass that you find a lot of and what's a C4 grass? So just so people have kind of got a bit of an idea about what they, what we're talking about. Well, C3 and C4 grasses just photosynthesize differently. So um, C3 grasses are usually found in more temperate um, climates. So they're really, you know, basically the grasses that you see out in your, in your garden. Um, and um, then the C4 Phragmites australis is one, um, and there are a few others. So um, 
they're found when things are a bit hotter, not necessarily drier, but definitely hotter. Um, so they're found in kind of hot um, tropical conditions as well as more arid conditions. Thank you, that's great, that's really helpful. Um, so yeah, and then we've got a question about some, about humans, when they eat food with containing phytoliths, do they absorb them? Um, I've not done any research into um, what is excreted, but I would assume that it would just kind of, it would just go out um, because we do get a lot of phytoliths in animal dung. Now, of course, the, the stomach processes are different from animal to animal, but we do find a lot of phytoliths being um, just running through the system and coming out of the back end of, of goats. Yeah. So um, I don't know is the answer. Uh -huh. And maybe one day there'll be some research, but I think I think there actually has been research into that in the US. I think Mark Spencer was mentioning that last, uh, there was a, we had a, a brief discu discussion a couple of weeks ago and I think it was um, human excrement. So it is um, quite likely uh -huh. that yes, um, if you want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, very, very interesting. I'm, I'm sure, actually. Um, and there's been a couple of questions about um, whether microfossils support the theory that basically this regional arid aridification has come from agriculture and over exploitation. So, it could, is that kind of theory borne out in the microfossil record? Um, depends on when. Um, we have a number of aridification events, if you want to call them that, but you know, um, points in time where things got drier. Um, now, what happened, you know, you have kind of overall trends, so a reduction in the level of precipitation by say 20%, but how that impacts what happens on the ground depends on what is happening on the ground and the topography and lots of other factors. So for instance, 4,000 years ago, we have um, a decrease in precipitation across the Near East and other areas. Um, in Iraqi Kurdistan, I saw absolutely no trace of this aridification because basically the rainfall went from 1,200 to 1,000 millimeters per year or something. You know, that there wasn't any impact mm -hmm. on the plants growing or how they were growing things or anything. Whereas um, if you're in a more marginal area, like this alluvial plain, um, any decrease is going to be noticed in the, uh, the microfossil record. Also, if you are doing things, so if you're trying to grow wheat, which they are, in an area that's marginal, so wheat takes a lot of water, Barley is better. Barley doesn't need, it, it's more saline tolerant, so it, it, can, um, it, it can withstand more saline uh, salts in the soils, um, and it doesn't need as much water. So barley is a much more drought resistant crop. Rice, wheat, these things need a lot of water. So if you're continuing to grow these things, even though things are dry and there's less rain, which means you have to irrigate more. So you're actually reducing the amount of, you know, the potable water that's available. Um, yeah, you know, then it's, 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 you know, one thing leads to another leads to another. So it, it becomes a cycle of, um, of desertification. You know, there's less water available. There's, you know, using more um, irrigated water and yeah. So that will increase the level of desertification. And so that's what we're seeing in Iraq. So it is a combination of human activity as well as climate change. Thank so, you so much. We call it accelerated climate change yeah, for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for that. And there's, there's lots more things popping up into the chat, but I'm afraid we're gonna have to kind of end it there.